Welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Shri Ayer. Today we join Professor M D Nalapat, who has been jetting around the world, uh, and he has some exciting information to convey in terms of what is happening in the interplay between India, United States, China, and Taiwan. Um, let's first take the the last three. Uh, U.S., China, and Taiwan, and their special relationships. What is changing? To get a real feedback on this thing, let's uh, welcome Professor Nalapat to the channel. Professor Nalapat, welcome to P Guru's channel. Thank you, thank you, Sri. So um, I just want to uh, touch base about your article in Sunday Guardian, where you mentioned about the relationships between how China grew with the expertise of Taiwan, and now how China is trying to, you know, make some moves in terms of its currency. And uh, if you look at Bitcoin-based transactions, I haven't looked in the recent past, but whenever I used to look, you know, there is a software, uh, there's a site that you can go to look at what Bitcoin transactions are happening. And almost always, one of the counterparties used to be China, in, located in China, whether it was Macau or mainland China, whatever it was. It was very interesting. And then I think China cracked down on it. They have regulated it. Remember that Bitcoin is only an application on top of blockchain. Blockchain as a technology is very good, can be used for many things. So, so I just want to set the context here. Professor Nalapat, what are the new moves China is making? Look, Sri. The United States and China are engaged in a fight to the finish. Yes, they are. Uh, it's, it's fine for uh, both sides are going to deny it. Donald Trump, frankly, I mean, I, I'm very confused about Donald Trump. I don't know whose side he's on, but except, uh, of course, the Trump organization. Beyond that, I'm not very sure. But the reality of the situation is that China under Xi Jinping is completely dedicated to being the number one country in the globe. And they're working with an extraordinary efficiency and to a tremendous sense of dedication to achieve this goal. One of the calculations is concerns currency. The Chinese understand that the dollar being the world reserve currency has given the US enormous power, enormous power in its own economy and enormous power in affecting other economies. Take, for example, the Iran sanctions. You know, a, a country like India, we are going to lose Chabahar because of the fear of the U.S. sanctions if we buy Iranian oil. And if you buy Iranian oil, if some con you know, companies break the sanctions, then insurance companies are all based and shipping companies are all based. There are all kinds of the commodity markets are based in London and the U.S. Unfortunately, in India, there was an effort to get commodity markets made in India. Uh, Jignesh Shah, you remember, created a lot of markets. Yes. And Chidambaram wiped that out. And I'm sorry to say this government is continuing that wipeout. And this government is, I mean, frankly, has done nothing to ensure that that kind of uh, visionary approach of commodity markets coming to India comes to India. I don't know why. I think North Block, frankly, is a mess. It was a mess during uh, Sonia Gandhi's time. And it's a mess during the NDA as well. But having come to that, I want to say, the Chinese are betting that the US dollar is going to have a major correction. Two things they're betting on. One, the frankly Trump playing with the US dollar, Obama as well playing with the US dollar, on going in for weaponizing the US dollar by going in for sanctions to meet its own political, mainly political, not really geopolitical ends. As on Iran, if I remember 2017, 2013, these were the years in which sanctions were imposed on Iran. Now, as a consequence, what's happening, you're weaponizing the US dollar. And then people all over the world are going to look at this and say, look, how can we trust the US dollar? Tomorrow, the US can go after us. Tomorrow, our dollar stocks can be affected. So when you weaponize the US dollar, you're also weakening the attractiveness of the US dollar as a reserve currency. The Chinese are banking on that. They are delighted, frankly, by the sanctions on Iran because now they have a near monopoly on Iranian oil 
and they can you know they can uh, dictate whatever terms they want india is not in the picture at all we have scurried away frankly uh, from iran and uh, as i said geopolitically it makes no sense at all either for you, for the americans or for us because we lose chabahar the americans also lose an ally having control of that vital port so the chinese are also betting on this major correction and they believe after this correction the us reserve a dollar as a reserve currency is going to go down the tube the euro is in a mess governance issues in the united european union are in a mess originally some people in the european union had the right stand which was essentially that europe should be a congeries of multiple states some of the existing countries can be broken up into different smaller states and all these states can coalesce into a european union and you have european institutions having a coordinated policy on finance on economics on foreign policy on defense that was obviously rendered impossible because the nation states are fighting back take for example catalonia catalonia wants to be independent the spanish are repressing it and the european union is doing nothing to stop the spanish because the european union is now dedicated to the nation state whereas the entire logic of the european union is to do away with the nation state so you have that contradiction of the heart of the european union which is finally going to destroy the eu so the euro is not the option what is the option here comes blockchain now xi jinping has said blockchain is going to be at the core of chinese technology and other development the advantage of blockchain is it is non hackable it is completely transparent so if you use blockchain you are making your system completely transparent in terms of transactions and you are ensuring it from being hacked the indian financial system the online internet system which frankly prime minister modi sought to you know basically encourage with a very hard blow on the head of the indian currency in 19 uh, you know 2017 and i date the bjp's uh, political woes and political problems to that particular decision you mean demonetization you mean demonetization yeah you know, yeah demonetization per se is not a bad idea but the way it was implemented was so clumsy it has been a disaster now the rea the reality of situation is blockchain is actually the chinese they believe it's their ace along with that uh, you know the cryptocurrency india we have banned cryptocurrency for god sake sri you're a technical man i am not how do you ban a series of numbers how are you going to ban that it's only some idiot in the reserve bank some fool in the in the ministry of finance who believes you can block and ban a series of numbers so we have quote unquote banned it the reality is it's unbannable and the second fact is india should have been up front on cryptocurrency we should have been leading the pack on cryptocurrency we should have been leading the pack on blockchain instead of which we have allowed china once again to pick up the baton what i'm saying is the chinese have been buying gold i've been we've been uh, tracking this for some time uh, i I've, i've got some friends for example who are analyzing this friends in new york friends in hong kong in other locations together we meet and we come to certain conclusions and one of the conclusions is the chinese are today the biggest holders of gold in the world they she did ever since she didn't ping came to power in 2012 the chinese have been quietly buying vast amounts of gold today they have enormous gold reserves what does that mean when the dollar collapses you have a currency totally backed and strongly backed by gold and you have a currency certified by blockchain what is, what's going to happen people are going to increasingly turn from the united states to china as a reserve currency of choice and that is going to add enormously to the geopolitical weight of china so this is the game that china is playing xi jinping is i can tell you a masterly player of geopolitics he is a true successor of not only of mao zedong the only problem is he hasn't quite managed to master the arts of deng xiaoping with the result that the economic management is far below the political and geopolitical management but so far as mao is concerned he has understood mao and he is basically actualizing mao's dream 
of putting China as the core of the of the universe, in so to speak, as the Middle Kingdom. Just to add to what uh, Professor Nalapar just said, uh, Richard Nixon, the U.S. president, took the U.S. dollar off of the gold standard in 1973. You see, there was an agreement in 1944 called the Bretton Woods Agreement, wherein all the allies, along with the United States, said that, okay, U.S. dollar shall be the one that will be backed against gold. And this gold was supposedly kept in a place called Fort Knox in the United States. And, and the U.S. used to boast from 44 to 73 that, look, we, our dollar is backed by gold. Now, what happened was an innocent thing in 1973. I don't know the real story, but I heard that the United Kingdom, which was owed some money by the United States, asked for payment in gold because U.S. used to say $31 uh, equal to, uh, you know, 31, one ounce of gold, which is 31 grams. So $1, uh, one ounce of gold was $1. And, and they said that, you know, can you pay us in uh, gold instead of dollars? And the U.S. realized that they didn't want to do that. And then Nixon took it off of the gold standard. So if the yuan goes and claims that it has enough gold so that it can be the one currency that can back its currency with the gold, that would be a huge game changer. And you add to that blockchain-based Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, you know, that is going to be in for some churn. But I'm sure, uh, Monoji, India will still say it is 70 rupees to a dollar. Look, I'm only worried it'll become 90 rupees to a dollar, frankly. <laughs> I expect it to be 30, 35 in the era of Modi. It's now 70 and running in the wrong direction. And I'm sorry to say that, uh, uh, you know, people who have got money in Swiss banks and foreign bank accounts, people who have, who have got illicit money in the form of dollars and euros, they'll be smiling. They'll be smiling until the dollar reset that Xi Jinping is forecasting comes about. You know, uh, you, I, and Dr. Swami are the only three people, I think, in the whole of India, perhaps in the whole planet, who are saying <laughs> that the, the rupee should be appreciating, not depreciating. Absolutely. <laughs> but see, I can tell you one thing. I'm, I'm a little ruined here. Look, you and I, both of us, you know, we have written PNs and PNs of articles, tons of articles about the shenanigans that happened in National Stock Exchange, about the people who manipulated there, about how SEBI kind of gave a slap on the wrist. And even that, they went and challenged in the SAT and got a stay on it. Now, you see, there is one other scam, which was the future currency map. Uh, currency futures manipulation. Whistleblowers have written letters to NS uh, to SEBI. Nothing has happened. You see, the the thing about Indian, uh, you know, governance is that whether it is Modi or uh, you know um, whatever, Mr. Manmohan Singh. Manmohan Singh is even worse. He was an economist for God's sake. He should have known what kind of havoc you know gaming the stock exchange would cause. And yet he sits now. And pompously, I don't know pompously, but you know, he he, he weighs in, pontificates uh, from Rajya Sabha about where this government is going wrong. You know, forgetting that he was in power for ten years. So, what are your thoughts, uh, Monoji? Where do you think this tipping point is going to come? Look, as far as SEBI is concerned, I've called it sleeping SEBI for a very long time. Yes. You know, in some situations it wakes up; in other situations, it's still at fast asleep. But so far as the NSC scam is concerned, I can tell you, co-location is concerned, it's a major situation which has completely affected the credibility of Indian markets. But I can tell you one thing, Sri, justice may come slowly, but justice will not be denied. There is enough electronic evidence against what, what happened in co-location. There is therefore evidence against what SEBI is doing. And I can tell you, a time will come within the next four or five years in which the weight of evidence is going to be so overwhelming that it's going to be impossible not to take action against SEBI. Remember, it took us five years of the Modi government and five years of North Bloc systematically sabotaging us to get Chidambaram in jail. I don't know what's going to happen to him today. Yeah, he's, he's got bail. He's got bail. Oh, well, yes. I'm not surprised that he's got <laughs> bail. I'm not surprised at he all. He has friends in high places, sir. Well, there are, you know, thousand cases you can slap against him. And you've got one of the most feeble cases you've slapped against him. And if no other case has been slapped against him, well, it's just a sign that you can do what you like and get away. But I can tell you, 
even on Chidambaram, finally he went in for some time. The weight of evidence is mounting against all of them, every one of them. And in three, four years, there'll be nowhere to hide because this is going to disseminate the internet to tens of millions of people. And the, no, the, no government, no finance minister will have anywhere to hide. And certainly the, the present bosses of SEBI, the previous bosses of SEBI, all those who participated in this, they're all going to be held to account on the basis of truthful data. Well, I, I, I really, really uh, hope and pray that that day will come soon and I'll be here and you'll be here and we will have a hangout again. Because this, this stuff, without a transparent financial market, investment isn't going to come. I, in fact, I just did, a, um, Monuji, I just did another uh, monologue this time on the H1B situation for 2020. You know, uh, the reality is from the consulting companies such as the Infosys of the world or HCL, their hit rate or, or their success rate is one in two. For two applications they are uh, applying for H1B, only one is coming through. This is after they're processing the paperwork. That means they have qualified to apply and then they're rejecting it. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that India needs to figure out a way to get the same jobs done in India, which means you have to create a situation where companies will come and invest and set up shop in India. So, you know, the, and 15% and for new companies started in India might not be enough because Dubai allows you to do it for free. Corporate tax zero, personal income tax zero in Dubai. If you start a new company, you just have to be in Dubai for one day in six months. And that is registered as, okay, that means you are a Dubai-based company. So India has still a long way to go, even in terms of trying to garner market, which it can claim it was rightfully its, because all these people used to come on H-1B visas and work in the United States. Those things are falling away. So, you know, we are in for very interesting times, even from that perspective. Well, Sri, I want to tell you that, as I said, I don't know where Donald Trump, I was supporting Donald Trump for a long time. But after what I've seen regarding Turkey, the, the way he is basically, and now Donald Trump today is actually functioning, if I may say so, as a domestic servant of Recep Tayyip Erdogan. I would like <laughs> to say these words clearly. He is a domestic servant of Erdogan. What the reasons are, I don't know. Erdogan is a Wahhabi fanatic who is trying to bring back Wahhabism, who is trying to defeat Mohammed bin Salman's effort to ensure the, that, that Wahhabism is, is, is destroyed. Is, Wahhabism has been a curse on Islam, a curse on the whole of humanity. And Mohammed bin Salman has been working on it. People in America, India, etc. have been working on it. And Donald Trump now goes and empowers the man who is the leader of the, of, the, uh, of the Wahhabi groups now. I don't know what he's doing, but I want to say the United States and the Western world cannot be secure unless it permits free migration of talented people from India. The reason why India is an ideal partner for the United States, one of the important reasons is the fact the working age population in China has been falling from 2015 onwards. In another about 40 years, about 20% of the population in China will have to maintain the remaining 80%. 20% maintaining 80%. It's unsustainable. India, on the other hand, has got a very young working age population and a working age population that's going to keep rising over this period. So the United States, Europe, Japan will have to rely on the Indian population. They'll have to rely, you know, to relax their controls on skilled immigration. And if they don't do that, God help them. They're going to be eaten alive for breakfast by China. Well, you're absolutely right, uh, Monuji. And, and a couple of things before I sign off today. One is that today in a press conference, Emmanuel Macron, uh, actually uh, took Trump to task over the same exact thing about Turkey and how you the uh, you know Turkey no longer belongs in the NATO because it has gone and bought S 400s. I know this is a topic that is uh, very very near and dear to your heart. I just wanted to place that on record. Also, another thing is demonetization. Why did it go wrong? I have an alternate theory about that. In fact, I. I have such a strong belief that my theory is correct that I've written a book of fiction called Who Painted My Money White? And it has this theory. It talks about how this theory came about. And it's, just, it's, a, it's a book of fiction. Not everything that is described there may have happened, but it gives you 
a view into the politics of India in, a, in about an eight to nine year period. And I, I really hope that readers will buy it. It's available on Amazon in ebook form. It is going to be available in paperback form very soon. I'm sorry to beat my own trumpet in my own channel, but it, it was inevitable because it was, we were talking about currencies. It also talks about what currencies can do to you. So, uh, Monty, Please, yeah. I just want to say, look, your writing is beautiful. I've, I've seen excerpts of it. I've read uh, it and I can tell you it's gripping writing. I can tell you, and I wish it were fiction, but too much of it is fact. That's the problem, frankly. But you know, uh, I simply want to say regarding demonetization, look, about 6% of black money is, was, is in the form of currency. The bulk of it is where you are in the United States, in the form of dollars, in the form of houses and condos in Miami, in New York, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in Atlanta, in Detroit, in London, you know, I mean, in, in Dubai, in Melbourne, in all these places, in Hong Kong. So that's where the money is. So you get at the, the little fellow, and you get at that 6% and ignore the, the 94%. And who, who suffers? The small, the very small people. People who are, in my view, anyone below 5 crore turnover a year is tiny. It's not worth bothering about by the tax authorities or the GST or anybody. I would say GST should apply only from around 50 crores plus because it's so complicated a system that only those who have got at least a turnover of 50 crores can afford the chartered accountants and lawyers needed to ensure that you comply. And if you don't comply, the government has put so many penal penalties in. I mean, I thought Chidambaram had put in a lot of penalties. I mean, I calculated. out of you know, There were about 1,100 absurd penalties during Chidambaram's time, and now there are about 1,700. So it's just going up. This passion to send people to jail is the passion of the Indian bureaucracy to make money. Because you get a prosecution notice, you panic, you empty your bank account, you sell your wife's gold jewelry, and you go and bribe the officer concerned. So I'm frankly, I'll say, I was, I mean, not a great fan of demonetization. And seeing what's happened to the BJP, you're seeing that map from 70% of the country, BJP rule states are now 40% and falling. Jharkhand is going to go. Delhi is going to go. So frankly, I've never been a fan of demonetization. I again believe that a bunch of officials and a bunch of people uh, you know, misdirected the prime minister. We have a wonderful prime minister, but unfortunately, he's surrounded by people who are much less wonderful. Well, you know, uh, they, these are very powerful words, uh, Monuji. And I know uh, our friends in PMO office in India do watch our videos. So please, uh, you know, this is a message. We, 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 we want nothing but the best for... We want a third term for Narendra Modi. Yes. He can't yes. get it unless he removes some of the trash that is accumulated in the highest portals of government. <laughs> and he also needs to appoint a few good ones who are standing outside or being kept outside. So... Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nalapat, and uh, very, very revealing discussion. And, and I hope that uh, viewers enjoy this uh, hangout with him and do subscribe to P Guru's channel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.